Hi everybody, it's Gil. It is uh, 1.15 and 10 seconds on Tuesday, August 16th, uh, after market sell-off today on heavier volume. So distribution day, uh, but also the market direction model switched to a sell signal today. Now you notice we had a nice bounce here and you actually opened up, you opened down, you closed a little lower, so you basically churned around mid-range with volume picking up. So it does seem like there's at least buyers meeting sellers mid-range in the market, but you have this this big break, and my view is that, uh, and I think Dr. K concurs here. Uh, you there, Dr. K? I sure am. Uh, I think uh, the bottom line here is that uh, this is pretty weak behavior, so you'd be looking for a rally and then another break to lower lows, and that's kind of what I'm looking at right now. In my view, probably the best place to be either today or within the next day or two, if this starts to really break down, we'll be on the short side. Now, you could ra continue to rally up here to the uh, 2600 level, which is right here. You can see it coincides with uh, these priorities of support. So you could continue rallying there, but you're not, you know, you're only about 3% away uh, from that. So that's doable. Will you get up there? Maybe, maybe not, but we'd watch it for now. Uh, Dr. K, with the model on a sell signal, what is the uh, stop loss? Uh, what's your your stop out uh, level? Well, I gave uh, one one level of guidance, which is uh, the stop level would be just above yesterday's close of 25.55 on the Nasdaq. Um, that's a suggested stop loss. I mean, that pretty much limits one's losses to about 1.3 percent on a one times ETF, or maybe about 4 percent on a three times ETF. So we're talking pretty small numbers. Um, you know, I already had some questions. People asked, why don't we just use the signal change? Of course, many, I would say most of our members probably just go by the signal, uh, the MDM change of signal. Uh, to change their positions, uh, but that was just a, a guidance uh, point that uh, some more conservative investors might want to might want to just reverse out sooner than that. Um, the model might very well switch signals if the Nasdaq does top uh, 25.55, but we'll have to see how the rest of the market's holding up uh, if we get to that level. Yeah, I think for now the one the one thing that I notice, and that is with, with people trying to get bullish. If you watch some of the financial TV, there's uh, I know there's somebody who was running around with an email from uh, this. Uh, oh, what is that? Uh, Demark uh, indicator, which I guess is an oversold, overbought indicator, and, and the Demark indicator is giving a big buy signal. Uh, I think when markets it get oversold, worked very well last time. Actually, I mean the the mark indicator has a very good track record. I've got to say. However, we're not in a normal market environment, and it, right. it issued a sell signal. Uh, I believe it was in December or January. Maybe someone knows the exact date, but it issued a sell signal, and then it issued a second sell sell signal, and the market kept kept rallying for another few weeks. So, um, you know, it's it, that was a QE driven uh, market, of course. And I think that in itself throws off a lot of these signals. Yeah, so you know they're saying you got a buy signal on the market, but I'm, where I would differ with that is that you don't see any leadership in any kind of position uh, to be bought right now. So you normally, you know, if you're if you're uh, correcting and then the market's setting up to turn, you're going to get a follow through day. You'll see stocks setting up in bases, leading stocks setting up in bases, and as we'll see in a few seconds here. That's not really what's going on. Uh, what you see, for the most part, uh, let's just pull this one out. You, you see a lot of stocks. You know, for example, look at Baidu today, getting whacked uh, after this rally. This looked logical too. And this is a good example of a, a late stage failed base, where here's your breakout point through here. It comes out. And I, I think we talked about this last week. And then it bounces. It doesn't bounce to the 50-day. It bounces further up to the 20-day. Sometimes the bounce up and through the 50-day can go as high as the 20-day uh, in, in some cases. And I think that's something to watch out for. Shorting into bounces a lot of times is sort of the reverse of catching uh, a falling knife when stocks are plummeting to the downside. I mean, it's not. It's a little bit like uh, catching a bouncing knife. You know, it's not like the, the knife has a lot of momentum as gravity is bringing it down. So catching a, a falling knife is a very dangerous proposition. But you know, if you're catching a bouncing knife, it doesn't have a lot of velocity on it, but it's spinning around and twirling about, and you might get yourself nicked a little bit. That's why you got to be testing 
into these rallies if you're going to try and short one of these late stage failed bases. Uh, Priceline has been another one like that. You notice all it's doing is hanging out underneath its 50 day moving average. It bumps up here, but notice how you do get these rallies up towards the 20 day moving average. If I was shorting this thing here, I'd be using the trailing 20 day moving average as a rough guide for a stop because it doesn't seem to be able to get. Uh, too far through that, at least based on these rallies in here, and yesterday's rally was even weaker, and now you're below the 50-day uh, moving average. The thing about these uh, late-stage fail bases in big leading stocks or big stock leaders like by, uh, Priceline and even Baidu is that sometimes once they do break down, that's really the meat of the move, and it may take a lot longer before it really starts to roll over. Uh, but to me, it looks like the damage that you're looking at in the market would argue for more downside. So the idea that we're going to come out of this thing and everything's going to be hunky dory and we're going to start a new market, I think, is a little premature at best, if not kind of silly, at least from my perspective. Um, so you see where we are at the indexes. We could be uh, stopping the bounce here, and we might just roll over here. We might continue higher. So we're keeping that stop on the Nasdaq, which is at yesterday's. Uh, High, as Dr. K just pointed out. So here's the uh, <clears throat> Nasdaq chart here. So you could continue bouncing here, but we'll see if this holds. Now, Dr. K, if you did get stopped out, it's always possible you could get another sell signal up higher or even one a little bit lower. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. Um, well, again, we're going to have to see how, how the market shapes up if the Nasdaq gets to that 2555 level. That doesn't necessarily mean the model will just switch back to neutral. Um, especially if the leaders are, are, are not um, following along with the rest of the market. Right, right. Um, is everybody hearing me okay? Some people say my sound is bad. I'm using a regular speaker uh, microphone, actually, uh, and I'm, I'm down at the office on the beach today. You can tell by my screen it's a little bit elongated. I have these big uh, Dell monitors that are, I don't know, 20-something inches wide. Uh, okay. No, it looks like everybody hears me pretty well. So I think there's one person who said that sounds like I'm coming out of a, uh, I don't know, a tunnel or something. Maybe yeah, maybe I am. Uh, but everybody else sounds okay. All right. So I just want to make sure it's not an issue on my end. Now remember last week, uh, towards the end of the webinar, my PC that I was on uh, gave me the blue screen of death. First time it's ever done that. Uh, I'm not quite sure why that happened. It might have been uh, I was unhooking earlier a uh, a big hard drive, a Seagate hard drive. Uh, I was unhooking it and, and uh, didn't uh, de uninstall the software. That may have caused a driver problem uh, that caused that. But of course, fortunately, it came at the end of the webinar, which was uh, fortuitous because you didn't have too much to say after that. And as I understand it, Dr. K finished up. If that happens again and you guys see me disappear, just hang out and I'll try to get back up. Uh, again, also, we can always have internet uh, outages and things like that. So far, we've been lucky. That's the only thing that we've had so far. Um, anyways, so of course, everybody's going to want to know about silver and gold. Um, I, from my perspective, uh, I was fixated too much on silver and gold uh, when the market started to break off the peak. And I should have just uh, focused on the short side, which I think is much more profitable. Uh, although this is a pretty decent move in gold, and it's continuing. You just have a little pullback. And notice how you close at the peak. So it's never violated the 10 day moving average. If you're still on gold, uh, which I am actually, uh, you can uh, just use the 10 day moving average uh, as your stop because I believe you're just crossing over into seven weeks. Dr. K, would you use a 10 week moving average here as your guide for a stop, as a selling guide? Well, you mean the ten, um, as the ultimate selling guide because the 10 week is so far, so far down. This um, one here, yeah. So. You know that that's uh, clearly you know gold is showing its leadership uh, in this market. It's got so many uh, tailwinds on its side, and uh, you know one one stop could be a violation of the 10-day moving average, um, which is you know uh, I guess that's your pink line, right? And the uh, green line right. is the 20-day. Uh, so yeah, you could possibly use the 10-day as one, as one stop, and then your 50-day as the ultimate sell stop. Yeah, and it would be entitled to a pullback. You know, last as we were talking about last week, uh, when the market has come off in the past, the precious metals have come down with the market, and so you had uh, pullback. I think about eight and a half percent occurred uh, last year. In, in 2008, I think it was a little more than that. 
but eventually the precious metals appear to bounce, bounce and bottom, actually bottom and then bounce after or before the market rather. So they'll tend to find support and find their lows first and then come out of it. But it's possible they could still uh, just continue to back and fill. This is pretty constructive, so you're not uh, too far off your peak at all. But you are getting a little bit extended in this position, and I would tend to think that you're going to pull back or at least you're going to have some sort of a bounce off the 10-day moving average. Uh, and that could become an ad point if it were to hold the 10-day moving average. Dr. K, would you be adding or initiating uh, GLD here? Well, if, if someone's not in, in the position at all, they could start by sizing in slowly like a 10% position, and then as the price proves itself, they can continue to add 10% every step of the way higher. Uh, that way, at least they have a little bit of skin in the game because, you know, th this pattern is... It's it's impossible to know whether it is going to pull back and retest or there's it's just going to go to new highs from here. So you might want to have 10 percent, you know, whatever whatever percentage represents a small position, um, an investor might want to take that small position here, and then they're not going to miss the trade because as gold, if gold just continues higher from here, then they can add every X percent higher. And psychologically, it's also important to have something in the position because then you have your small position as it goes higher. Psychologically, you know you've got some profit in this uh, this ETF. How about silver? Do uh, you like the SLV here? I'm a little more skeptical on silver be just simply because it's really been lagging. And I'm thinking that it's lagging for... Okay, the bullish reason is that that would make me very bullish on silver here is that it's lagging simply because the uh, margin uh, interest was raised once again, um, or margin requirements rather on they also silver. Raised gold though last week. What's that? Yeah, I know they raised it on both, but it's possible silver is more sensitive. I'm not real clear on that. I'm I'm more uh, to think though on the bearish side that silver is lagging. Primarily because people think of it as more of an industrial metal, and if you know, we know that commodities have taken on on the chin in the last few weeks. So if we're going to go into a potential uh, recession in here, yeah, you know, the markets, of course, are going to be looking nine months down the line. So if they're forecasting a recession, we're going to see it show up as we are right now in commodities, and maybe that's why silver is dragging. In which case, it's best to focus on gold. In my take is pretty much based on the same theory that they're, the industrial side of silver is what the investors have been focused on and not so much its role as uh, alternative currency. Uh, also silver is a little more plentiful than gold, uh, not as uh, gold is much more finite and gold is seen more as a broader uh, store of wealth because really it only has two uh, purposes or uses. One is as money, as coins, and the other is as jewelry which is also another uh, form uh, in which people like to store well. So silver, on the other hand, is an industrial metal. They say there are new uses being discovered for it every week. And so it seems to lag a little bit. Now, that said, you know, they could set up again and take off. So we're kind of keeping an eye on that. Um, we were actually both in the GLD and the SLV, and we got out uh, at the peaks uh, at the beginning of August and did OK. Missed this in silver. We were much more heavily weighted. Uh, but really, we could have held on to the GLD, but we chose not to. We're just kind of hanging out uh, because we've done well this year. We're playing defense more than anything uh, and not and waiting for another buy point in gold. So for those of you who still own the GLD and uh, if you didn't sell it uh, when uh, silver was looking bad, because that could easily scare you out, uh, you're still holding it looks fine, and you still want to be holding, picking either the 10-day or the 20-day, I think, as your near-term uh, guides for support, but you know it could go into another correction here and build a base before it continues higher. But I still think the long-term uh, story for gold is higher, and definitely with its role as money. Um, now we're looking at bonds. Uh, bonds are still getting a bid, and like I said last week, I don't think that the reason for the market sell-off uh, has anything to do with the S&P downgrade because money is looking for a place to hide. Um, you notice that the uh, Swiss franc went into a parabolic move last week, and that was a climactic top. Anybody who owned this uh, currency ETF, I'm sure, knew to sell it in there. And then you come off, but you're still seeing movement 
into, I think a lot of that with the Swiss franc, maybe because Swiss authorities were trying to uh, do something about their rapidly appreciating currency, because that's a problem. Is that correct, Dr. K? You might have a better yeah, handle on absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah, the Swiss, the Swiss government did what it could to um, basically uh, weaken the Swiss franc because uh, they don't, it's not in, it's not in the Swiss government's interest uh, to see a very strong or excessively strong Swiss franc because it hurts their exports. So really you've seen money coming into to bonds. So there's a safety bid to me and I think there's more a problem with what's going on in Europe uh, than anything. But you know, if there are problems in Europe, they're going to continue to weigh on the U.S. Anyway, so that's where we're at with gold, silver, the market, bonds, the dollar. Breaks down, making a lower low. It's down at the low end of this big kind of, uh, I don't know what you call this, messy, goopy, gunky little range here going all over the place. You can see all the news where it's, it's, uh, there's a fear bid goes into the dollar and then something happens here and money comes out of it. But, you know, look at the net... Uh, position of the dollar here is very close to its lows from last April and it looks to me like the trend for dollar for the dollar rather remains uh, to the downside yeah it's pretty also. ugly there's, there's nothing constructive in there and on a weekly chart you can uh, see that when when the dollar has downtrended um, that was then eventually met with an uptrend it was it was a lot more constructive I mean this is just sloppy and it's really going nowhere at all which telegraphs to me that the next move is down yeah and you could say it's pretty much in the uh, still in the downtrend you have this little move above this trend line here but you could always use this point here and you're following that trend line for now so this doesn't look so good so lo long term and even short term as long as this is happening it has to be positive for gold notice though that the dollar moving lower is not good for the market so there's forced selling out there. That's really what's driving a lot of what's happening in the market right now. So um, as far as we're concerned, you're likely to have more of that going forward. You know, it's just a matter of how much of a rally are you going to get. So what I want to do now is I want to go through uh, some of the stocks I'm keeping an eye on here as potential short sale candidates. Of course, you all know we've been talking about um, Priceline is one name and we thought here you could have taken some profits looking for it to rally back up into this area and it did it's coming off again uh, as I pointed out earlier if I'm short this one you're probably holding it using the 20 days your ultimate guide for a stop on the upside uh, you could always use a 50 day if you're theorizing that it's weaker but um, you know today you got some heavy volume on the downside and uh, doesn't look very healthy here Sohu went a, a lot higher than its 50 day moving average uh, and again, the 20-day came into play here on this one as well. So you see how when they start to break down through the 50-day, you don't really know whether the rally is going to end here. And that's why as I'm testing a position, I might short a little bit here on this day and it comes in and then I stop myself out at the high. You could test another uh, position here at the 200-day, uh, which is the red line here, and you could stop yourself out at the high. And then you get up into the 20-day. And sometimes if it's getting too far and extended to the upside, then you can just try hitting it on any given day, taking a position, and it starts to work. You can add to it. Now you've got Sohu back below the 200-day moving average. Volume is picked up. Could be shorted here using the high of today as your stop, which would have been 82 bucks even. So it's only about 3 bucks from here. Uh, that's going to put you about 3.5% uh, on the upside as far as your stop if you did that. So, But I think I like... Uh, Keep an eye on Baidu here. I definitely watch this. Any rally that fills this gap or up into the 50-day might end up being shortable. There's a lot of volume coming into Baidu here. And the thing to keep in mind about Baidu, in my opinion, uh, is that, let's see, what is this here? It should be a weekly chart. Let's change this. And then Baidu's had a huge move. And it, this is a late-stage cup. It almost has uh, a little bit of that, you know, mini pod or punch bowl of death look, where a lot, a lot of times, the late stage base that fails tends to be a big sloppy cup type pattern. Um, so it's kind of late stage pod. You know, it's not a classic pod in terms of being a real deep dive followed by a real steep as ascent. But a lot of times, you get these what I call mini pods that form as late stage bases. 
And you see this huge volume here. This thing is really starting to swing around and gets nailed on huge volume. So I'm going to think, uh, I'm going to guess here that this is probably looking at a longer term top. So I think you'll see this thing eventually correct a lot more than it has already. Maybe testing a uh, uh, hundred level soon. Uh, maybe even lower eventually if we go into a continued bear market. But that's one I'm definitely watching as a top leader that you can come after uh, with the idea of shorting it at some point down the road here when, when it really starts to break down if we get into a extended bear period. And that, I think that's definitely uh, possible. Dr. I want to interject real quick with a couple of questions on some comments you made that have come up. Uh, here's one. Uh, can you explain further how the market is forward looking for things like gold commodities and supposedly stocks, but yet so knee jerk news reactive? Yeah, so they want to know essentially how, well, the, the market tends to, uh, it's, a, it's a discounting mechanism. So, in other words, if it senses that there's going to be a slowdown in demand for commodities, uh, due to a recession, and that recession usually is nine months down the line. Uh, it could be even you know anywhere between six to twelve months ahead. The market has tends to have a very good track record on predicting recessions six to twelve months down the line, and you'll see it in the prices of commodities and stocks. Um, now that is what I would call a intermediate term trend observation, uh, or you call it intermediate to long term trend. Uh, in the shorter term trend, you get all kinds of headline news items that can jostle the, the markets up or down, um, and there can be a lot of volatility in there as well. So I guess the best way to look at this would be if you're looking at a day, daily chart and you're seeing a lot of noise in the pattern over a period of days to a few weeks, that's your headline news driving those patterns. But if you look at a weekly chart or even a monthly chart, and then you're going to start to see the longer term trends emerge, and, and that uh, for instance, the market uh, top in uh, early 2008, um, that, that was, if you look at a weekly on any of the major averages, you'll see that uh, there was definitely a, a defining quality to the market topping, to leadership topping, and also the fact that in 2008, uh, you really didn't have uh, much leadership um, being able to come out of its basing patterns. 2008 was more or less a year where there was very little uh, in the way of profits on, on the long side. Um, so in other words, the market was already telegraphing to investors at the beginning of 2008 that this market is not right. And uh, I, I do remember in 2008, I, I, took, I took very few long positions. The, the only time that the window seemed like it might be opening was, uh, I believe, in March of 2008. And that was it. I remember I took a few positions and then I quickly reversed them. Um, and it wasn't really much of a rally, and then the market continued to go lower. So, um, you know, when you look at the markets, it's always important to look at the weeklies and to get a broader view of what really is going on. Um, and we all know that uh, the commodities also had their tops uh, in 2008. So there were plenty of warning signs um, to essentially stay out of the market or to go toward the short side, um, which, of course, was enormously profitable later that year. I wanted to point out one thing. I was showing the wrong volume on the Baidu. And you basically have a big stalling uh, off the peak here, and then you break on very heavy volume. You could get some support this past week, but it looks like you're already going to be trading heavier volume this week as you come down. So I had the wrong chart up on the volume on that one. So I just wanted to cover that again. Now, here's one I like. Uh, this is Cena on a long-term uh, weekly chart here. You can see you've had a big move. And you might say, you know, you got a head here, here's the right side of the head, here's a shoulder, here's a right shoulder, and you can draw a neckline. Now, this is an ascending neckline. Usually, that is not as weak a pattern as a descending neckline. But in this case, I think this might work. And I think at this point, you can use, uh, you close at 97.91, you could use a 50-day at 102.38 here as a stop, or the high here at 106 if you want to give it more room. Uh, but I would think that if this thing breaks at the 200 day here, it's heading a lot lower. All the Chinese internets were uh, in trouble, and I think that they are becoming shortable. Baidu, Sina, Sohu. Of course, we were playing with Sohu, and uh, that one was a little difficult. But look at the pattern here. You know, you had a big move, now you got a left shoulder, a head, a right shoulder, and now you've rallied up into the 
uh, right shoulder, but you're running into some resistance in here. So yeah, it can go past a 50 day. That's why you're testing these and you're stopping yourself out, usually using the high of the day that you uh, shorted. And then you want to come in when it starts to wobble and turn over. Now, this may be starting to do that. And so I kind of like the way these are set up on the weekly charts, okay? So we looked at price sign already. Amazon is living below its 10-week uh, moving average here. This is a base here, one, two, three, four, five, six, comes out in the seventh week and breaks out to new highs. But notice this comes straight up off the bottom. Uh, so it's got that little bit of a flaw. It didn't really take any time to, to pause and consolidate. And you had the move and gap up here on earnings. And since then, you've broken down pretty hard. You're underneath the 50-day. Of course, this becomes shortable uh, using the 50-day of the 10-week as your stop. Now, let's say that, here we go looking at the day. Now, remember that we talk about how some of these can rally up and fake you out and go higher. So you're watching them come up into, say, the 20-day. I think Amazon, in this case, up around 210. If you had any kind of move up in there, that would coincide with the 20-day. And this little consolidation underneath would now be resistance. So I would tend to see that as an extent of any, the extent of any rally from here. But notice how over the past few days, it hasn't been able to get Above the 50-day moving average, this is actually a little wedging rally over the prior three days as you come down. And so this is just starting to uh, to happen in, in terms of setting up as a potential late-stage failed base. So <clears throat> let me see here. Somebody will have some questions. <laughs> well, we've got some political questions. Do we want to even get into that? <laughs> um, somebody asked, um, I'm short Finisar. Well, I guess you could short it, but you know, I don't know. For my money, the, the place is short Finisar was up here when we were first talking about it. Yeah, it looks like it wants to go lower. So I guess if you're using that as a stop, you know, this is still a big head and shoulders. This area has been uh, support for the stock, which is just the bottom of this prior base. And this is one that we have talked about before. So it looks like it might be getting shortable, but what would your target be? I suppose you'd be looking for it to head down through 12 and maybe break support, but then when that happens, you're on top of this base over here. Uh, let me shrink this just a little bit. Yeah, so you'll you'll be up on uh, on top of this here if you undercut. So, you know, 12, 10 possibly. Um, you know, the downside is uh, Cisco comes in and says they're going to buy them out at 40 bucks, and so maybe one to watch out for. I don't know. I don't think Finisar is one to be bought. Um, I've been watching uh, and actually trading a little bit uh, Rax today. Uh, Rax is looking like late stage double bottom failures. It's a breakout failure, rallied up into the 200 day. I actually thought this was going to take a little bit more time to set up and then it just blew apart and you did actually have a big crazy rally on earnings. So this is what Rax looks like on the daily chart. And you did have this big rally here, which would have thrown you off, so you wouldn't have been shorting it into rings, I don't think. But now that you've broken down and you get this rally back up, picking up volume, I would watch for any little blip up to the 37 level tomorrow or the next day as a one last little hurrah for racks before I think it rolls over and retests this low. You would use as your stop, I think, ultimately the high of this day, which is 38.33. So some setups. We might put these out later on the website. Let me see what other ones have I been looking at. A lot of these these rally, rallies, these are what I call floaters. You know, they break down real hard, and then you get this rally where the volume is real uh, weak and real tepid. But they keep floating higher, so floating. So I, I call them floaters, like wedging rallies. And there's a number of these uh, that have been doing this. I've been watching some of the agricultural stocks, uh, which have been having these floater type rallies. They start to come. I notice. Uh, Monsanto rallied right up into the 50-day. Now it's between that and the 200-day moving average on a uh, weekly chart. <clears throat> Flipping back and forth pretty quick. Uh, you have this big break. You got some pretty big support here, but still, you know, that, it makes sense for it to find support off of these lows, which is on top of this pattern and at the lows in this structure here. So. This looks like a late stage failure and tried to break out and fail. You rally into the 50 days. So anything, you know, it closes at 69. You can use 7085 or this, the high of today, either or as your uh, 
stop, but it looks like this might want to break down further. So I also notice you have AGU um, doing the same thing. They look similar, not as, as well developed in terms of breaking down as I might like to see, but I'm starting to pick these up. And look at Mosaic looks even better. Uh, you get some volume support here. That makes sense. You undercut this low. You know, you get some volume turns with the market. You're rallying back up on the weekly. You're stalling out here on the daily chart. You know, it's a floater type rally. You did get some volume here. So, you know, the flip side of these is that they look like they're running into uh, resistance. They're, they're floating up into resistance, and then you, know, you expect them to, to just break apart. And that doesn't happen all the time. Because just let me show you an example. Um, I thought this was a good one. It was a Ruben Networks had this big floater rally, and then it you know it, it comes up into the 50-day and it flips around. Remember, this was right about the time when they started that new Sky SKYY uh, cloud computing ETF, and that was pretty much the top of all of those. Uh, but you can see how they'll you know come up here, it breaks down, now it comes into the 50-day, and it hangs out there for a few days, and then finally it looks like it's going to get back above. There's no volume on it, and then boom, it starts to break down. So when these things come up, you know, let's use the racks as an example, which I think that one's shortable in here. But it could, you know, rally tomorrow and then hang out a little bit before it rolls over, or it could just blow to pieces. If it did, that would tell you we're in a pretty weak market. So I noticed some of the retailers, like limited brands, a floater rally right up into, uh, you call this a cup of the handle that just failed right here. And notice how it breaks down below the 50-day and spends a few days just back and forth, back and forth in here. So if you're shorting it, it's first it's going to drive you nuts before it lets you make any money. So a lot of times, you know, you can come in and hit them, and if it doesn't go anywhere, back away and do it the next day, and eventually you catch a move like this, and now you're off and running. Um, today you see it holding the 200-day moving average. Looks to me like it wants to blow below the 200-day moving average, mainly because you're looking at this area here and this area over here as being uh, re upside resistance. So if it can get through there, then maybe it's heading for the 20-day or the 50-day. But this looks to me like uh, it could be in trouble. And I just look at that. I look at JWN Nordstrom or JW Nordstrom, uh, which I'm glad to say my, neither my wife or my daughter shop at because they think it's way too freaking expensive, and I tend to agree with them. Um, but in any case, you can see the same sort of floater rally, and it rallies. And here's where you get above, well above the 200-day. You see this? And you can just study a lot of examples like this and get a sense of if you're shorting a stock in here, you know, get a feel for what it might do, you know, the possibilities, because that's really what it takes if you're going to try and short the rally is catch a bouncing knife, as I say it, I'd like to say it, uh, you know, you can, you can roll over very quickly and they can give you a little bit of trouble, uh, and you may have to be shorting and getting stopped out very quickly and then coming back again a little bit higher, sometimes maybe even a little bit lower, but uh, you're just trying to catch that inflection point, doing it in small amounts. Um, let's see, who would be better for the economy, Bachman, Perry, Romney, or Obama? And don't say, Ob well, Obama I think is probably, uh, I don't know, I'm beginning to think that he's just stupid, okay? Um, because I heard him say today that they're coming out, he's coming out with his plan and it's going to fix everything, create jobs, and I just, the first thing I thought is, well, if you have this great plan, uh, what's taking you so long uh, to come out with it? But uh, as I noted, Stuart Varney, my buddy Stuart on Fox, as he pointed out, if there is a plan, we won't hear about it until after Obama goes on his three-day campaign uh, trip that's costing $1.1 $1 .1 million for the taxpayer, and I guess he's got a three-day vacation as well, so, you know, we, he has his priorities, and I don't think the economy is one of them. Uh, I don't really know who would be better for the economy. Uh, I think we should just get, I, I don't think it should be a matter of which politician is better for the economy. I think it's more like uh, which politicians can we get out of the way uh, and, and make it uh, so that the economy can just do its thing rather than being impeded by government. So I, I think we need to take a lot of the focus off of uh, these politicians, but I would say who is the one that's going to get the government off our backs? I guess. Yeah, you know, small politics. government. Small government. You want you want minimal but, government. You know, it comes back to the uh, the tenets of objectivism to have a you know a government that's in place to protect people's rights um, and and not have all these extra pork belly projects and all this craziness 
that uh, you know the government, the U.S. government, and other world governments have continued to build and build and build upon themselves, uh, making th themselves bigger, uh, costing taxpayers more money down the line. Um, and you know that we need someone in place that will really, essentially, revolutionize the system. That's the problem. Anyone who wants to do make that big a change is probably not going to get elected. But that's really what's needed um, if we if we want to preserve the long term. Uh, health and sanctity of, uh, of the U.S. Yeah, I would argue that Republicans in that regard are, you know, they like to get in the way as much as uh, Democrats do. So I think you just need to get rid of these uh, statist politicians. Now, I noticed in the Iowa straw poll that Bachman did well, but also Ron Paul, my personal favorite uh, as a libertarian, he actually did pretty well, much better than he might normally. And it'll be interesting to see how he does in the primaries, because I really consider him to be the only uh, libertarian candidate out there, and he doesn't inject a uh, religion into the argument. I, you know, I, I get, I, I have to admit, I, I'm a little disturbed by uh, Michelle Bachman on TV trying to explain what she means when she's submissive to her husband. Uh, you know, and then some, and then they made a big deal out of a, a picture of reading a corn dog. And you know, what all I want to know is. Why don't they ever make a big deal about a male presidential candidate eating a corn dog? You know, I think we're a little too fixated in this repressed society of ours. But uh, you know, I, I do tend not to like these candidates who wear their religion on their sleeve. Not that religion is a bad thing. I just don't think it has any place in governing a country when you have so many different uh, religions and other spiritual practices that people engage in. But you know, I think if it uh, keeps the politician in line, then maybe that's helpful, but uh, who knows. <clears throat> Anyways, where was I? Oh, here's one I like. Iron Mountain. Short this one. I put one out. Put a little position on this out. Right up into resistance here. Around the 20-day, this is a pretty steep bounce. It could go a little bit higher than the 50-day, but it looks kind of weak here. Uh, and this is a little bit like uh, some of these other texts, but you know, these guys have 6%, I think minus 6% earnings growth in the most recent quarter. Let me check that real quick. Minus 9% earnings growth in the most recent quarter. Uh, and this comes on the heels of 8% earnings growth and 16% earnings growth over the prior two quarters. So uh, I think this one looks interesting here as it comes right up into resistance. Notice how you, know, you get this V shape, and this is what I'm talking about when you're Here's, if you're trying to buy this thing and you think you're going to buy it, this is catching a falling knife. But once it bounces, you're trying to short it. You are uh, trying to catch a, a bouncing knife. And so, you know, you can put it out and it'll push you a little bit. It looks like it's going to give it up right here. But then yesterday it rose a little higher. And oftentimes uh, that's a function of what the general market uh, is doing. But this looks like it's worth a shot using the high of today as a stop. So let's see. What else am I looking at? Las Vegas Sands. Uh, comes up to the tune today. Notice how on this particular example you break down real hard and now you rally. Look like you're going to stop here. Uh, but you know, if you're using this simple uh, idea, if you short it here around the 50 day and you use a high of the day as you're stopped, then you're stopped out here real quick. And then you can come back uh, after it again in here, but the next day you're stopped out again real quick. And then you can come back after it in here. Now, maybe at the 200 day, uh, you're going to be successful. You know, also maybe here you're not doing anything because you're in between the 200 day and the 50 day and maybe what you'd rather see in this case is a breakdown through the 50 day moving average. So there's a lot of ways to skin a cat here when you're trying to short uh, stocks but you give them a little bit of, of leeway and as you're setting up you try and use tight stops. If you're the type of person who can sit through a 10% uh, move against you on the short side then you can use bigger stops and that might work for you over the long run but you really need to have the market in your favor as far as a bear phase goes. So I wanted to cover a couple others. Apple is always one that gets a lot of questions. Perfect bounce off the 50-day moving average right on top of support. That was pretty much it. And uh, it's rallied back up on a floater rally back up into the 20-day moving average. Notice that. So you break the 50-day looking like you're going to be a uh, late-stage failed base, but you get a bounce because, after all, it is Apple. And it rallies right up in the 20-day. Now, if you're thinking this might be a late stage fail base, or you consider it to already be a late stage fail base, given that it closed once underneath the 50 day and broke down through the buy point, which is around 363, at least uh, as IBD calls it. I kind of look at it as a zone between here and here uh, as a breakout point. So it really hasn't broken down below that. 
but it very well could off of these levels, and this would be your short zone is right in here at 385, which is underneath this area, which is now resistance in the 20-day. So the thing is, if Apple topped here and really broke down uh, for good, uh, that would be a very interesting sign for the market. So... Let's see, looking at some questions here. Now we got one here. Um, asks, uh, can you please explain how you would determine selling exhaustion? And that, that's in re reference to the, uh, the model um, going from a sell signal to a neutral signal uh, several days ago. Um, and essentially, selling exhaustion, um, it's dictated by price volume action. And sometimes it's going to be a huge drop in price on massive volume after a long downtrend um, and sometimes this occurs not only in the leaders but in, in major averages uh, and sometimes you'll even see it on a micro level such as the intraday level where the market's been going lower for a good part of the day and then it has a huge downward drop on a huge spike in volume and that often will be the selling exhaustion in other words everyone's now it's at a climactic selling point uh, most of the most people at that point are out um, and so that often can be an intraday entry point to the buy side for, for day traders out there. Um, but often, since it is on an intraday level, it's usually just for the day or the next couple of days. Um, but all of that said, the, the real focus is always on price volume action of the leading stocks and the major averages to identify selling exhaustion. Anyways, yeah, so with Apple, I'm going to wrap it up with the short side, but some of the questions that we're getting, uh, I mean this one, someone says, I understand the low point in the market which provides support like 2600 and the NASDAQ did back in June can become a line of resistance what is this? once it is breached and the market starts to come back up. Well, I understand this is how things work. What I do not understand is the market dynamics or the dynamics of institutional buyers that cause it that cause a point of support to become a point of resistance when it is breached. Well, if you think of a, a support as an area where uh, buyers have been coming in to buy the stock, that that's a line of uh, in the sand that they've drawn as buyers. And once you start to break down below that in a meaningful way, now those buyers are all underwater. And I think uh, you're starting to look at a situation where they have to pair positions back depending on how active they are. You know, I don't. I don't think you can necessarily look at a chart and and consider what goes on in the minds of institutional investors. Guys sitting in offices. I mean, I've met and I've known a lot of institutional investors, and uh, you know, they, there are a lot of reasons that they will sell or buy stocks. Sometimes they will they will support stocks at uh, what are logical support levels, and sometimes they do that with the deliberate uh, purpose of creating support at a logical level of support as everyone believes it to be and so it, it sort of reinforces that concept for everybody and they'll come in and do that. I also know institutional investors who used to force breakouts in stocks particularly after they've had decent moves in order to sell into the breakouts and that's what a late stage based failure is all about. So you know, support is, is, is generally works because that's pretty much a point at which uh, investors have been drawing a, a line in the sand and buying the stocks and when it comes down in there you know they'll initially that support will hold so we just look at an apple here you know uh, it would come down to this 330 level and buyers would be there and then finally when it broke down you know you saw some money come out of it and then it was able to shake everyone out and turn around but usually support levels work because uh, that is the line in the sand that's been drawn or the point at which a certain critical mass of institutional investors believe a stock should be bought based on intrinsic value and so they'll keep buying it and at some point the support may uh, break simply because after it's pulled back several times and the buyers have supported they eventually don't have any funds left to allocate to that stock and it breaks down until it finds another uh, set of buyers at a lower level who believe that it is a buy at that level and so you know Apple probably becomes a buy down in the low 300s because it was selling at 13, 14 times estimates and at that point it will start to draw in value managers as opposed to growth managers. And I think Apple still trades like a value stock and you got to wonder why. Um, and it's uh, 
And somebody said to me, that's probably because their forward earnings aren't going to be as great uh, as everybody thinks they are. So anyway, so that's that's my take on sport. If you have more questions like that, just email us. Um, somebody says they went short LBS this afternoon. How does it look? Well, I don't know. Like I said, it's got resistance at the tuner day. So I hope your stop is either the high here or the high here. And uh, that looks okay. On Fossil, um, that's one we looked at last week. That's a brutal break. We see the floater rally above the 200-day moving average, and it just rolls right over. So there you go. Um, we'd use a 200-day moving average as an upside stop. You could use a 200-day moving average, or you could use a high this day or this day. Um, and that's one way to handle it. What would you need to see in the SLV uh, for it to become viable, Dr. K? That's the question we have. Well, that's an easy one. Uh, basically, you wanted to see uh, SLV clear uh, that prior peak there. So basically, 41.20. That was a high of uh, August 4th. Yeah, so so if we started to see, uh, first of all, I need to see two things. I want to see that it can clear that price point, but um, I would also want to see that on the basis that um, you know gold is not overwhelmingly leading. Uh, usually SLV is supposed to be more volatile than gold and when gold goes on an uptrend SLV wins out. O SLV will on a price basis will outperform GLD so I'd want to see SLV out starting to outperform GLD and clear that, uh, that price point. Okay, that works for me. Uh, let's see here. Someone asks, you know, I've talked about, whenever I talk about shorts, you pay attention to what I'm talking about when I talk about target uh, levels. Let's just say as an example, if you were going to short Monsanto off the 50-day and it did break down, what would you be your first downside target? Well, it already undercut this low here in rally, but it hasn't undercut this low, so that would become my target on a new break to the downside. And that's usually what you're looking for. So like, say, on Baidu, for example, uh, what would your target be? Well, you broke down here, undercut this low, broke down and turned around and rallied. Now you'd expect it to come down under this low, probably hit the 200-day moving average, and then try to bounce. So if you're shorting it from here, maybe your downside target is initially the 200-day on the first target, then you look for it to bounce, and then if it rolls over, you short it again, then your next target might be this area. So I'm always looking at areas that coincide with uh, prior lows, undercutting prior lows, like this low here, this might undercut. And then notice that if it did undercut that low, it might find support at the 200-day moving average. So that would become a logical area uh, for the stock to bounce from. It doesn't mean it's, it has to, but if you're setting uh, downside targets and you're trying to get you know 10% or so, 10, 15% out of a move. So let's say you got a bounce tomorrow and by you're able to short it at 140 and it breaks down to 125 while you got your 10% move on it, you could bag your profits and then look to reshort on the bounce. Short selling is a lot more active than playing on the long side where you try to build positions and sit with them. And the reason for that is, as you can see, you get very sharp rallies to the upside. So you can either see a lot of profits evaporate if you sit through a nice move where you get a 15, 20, and if you're real lucky, maybe a 25 or 30% gain real quick. If you sit too long, you can see that evaporate very quickly. Uh, but if you have a lot of intestinal fortitude, you could just look at, at a rally at some point to add your position. Let's say you know, you got short. I, I guess if you got short Baidu here, you got stopped out pretty quickly here. If you could have got short again here, it rolls over. Uh, you know, that's a little bit. Uh, now, if it, let's say you got short in here and it broke down. Now, the rally back in here, maybe you could add to your position there. But a lot of times, I would just let it kind of play out based on the position I bought here originally. I don't really average up on uh, short positions, although. I think that as these start to break down, you can uh, try to build positions, but we'll see how that uh, works out as we move through some of these patterns over the coming weeks and see how, where they end up going. Um, there's always potential for these to take some time to break down, or if we get into a very bad market here, uh, they could really blow apart. So let's see, what else? Any other questions now? Let's see. Somebody mentions. Uh, I've read that you do not have support in the index. So would you agree? Uh, I don't know what that means. I, I think that you do get support levels can work. They can also not work. So, <laughs> you know, they're not, there's nothing uh, about them that uh, makes them perfect or that they always, uh, 
you know, uh, are going to work. So somebody points out uh, FCFS one for the long. No, not really. I, I don't really like this pattern. What is this stock, anyways? First Cash Financial Finance Consumer Loans. I I wouldn't really, you know, what is the trade? One hundred thousand shares. 232,000 shares is junk, V-shaped, trying to break out. Man, that's not one to watch for the long time. That's a, that's a dog. I don't want to waste my time with that. You want big leaders, not stocks that trade 200,000 shares a day. Um, <clears throat> Here's a question um, that emailed in. Uh, having never used a trailing stop before, can you give any guidance as to how it should be used? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a basic question of, you know, using a trailing stop. You, you can put the stop uh, a certain percentage below where the stock is trading, and as the stock moves higher, then you gradually move that stop higher as well. Uh, but just make sure that it's placed in logical areas below support. So if it breaks that support, then it's logical that you're uh, taking your profits. Um, one common area of support is the, uh, the the moving averages, such as the 10-day, the 20, and the 50-day. Um, and a violation of a particular moving average is often one uh, technique. We talk about it uh, on the website and also in the book, um, the violation of moving averages as a good selling point. So let me ask you a question. Uh, Last week, TrimTab says there's $9 billion. I think that's what they're saying. 9x billion. Is that nine times a billion? $9 billion uh, withdrawn from mutual funds. Uh, I think that's one of the things that could be a problem for the market is funds continuing to be pulled out of, uh, or money pulled out of mutual funds. A lot of baby boomers are retiring. And the bottom line is, in the last 10 years, they've all been screwed. Uh, and I know a lot of people who had 401ks that were just brimming back in 2000. But, of course, you know, when the market corrected, they were a long-term holder of their uh, mutual funds because everybody told them to. The only problem with the long-term is that it eventually becomes short-term. Uh, so all these people approaching retirement now uh, have seen their retirement accounts get whacked, and uh, they're screwed. So I think that trend could continue. Now, the question is asking... If people are pulling money out of mutual funds and they're forced to liquidate and need redemptions, this is going to lower their cash position. Now, uh, in the question you're talking about, two to four percent cash positions that they maintain. Some of them do, some of them don't. Some of them can maintain a lot more cash and go. You know, when Bill O'Neill ran the New America Fund, uh, that fund, uh, its prospectus said that it could go to 50 percent cash if necessary, and most of them. Uh, and have different, uh, you know, four to five, maybe uh, five to ten. Yeah, it really depends. It isn't really a hard and fast rule. But I do think, in general, if you have redemptions and that continues, then uh, the mutual funds are forced to sell in order to meet redemptions. And the greater uh, that number becomes, the more they're going to sell. And that's one component of forced selling. Now, the other side of forced selling that we talk about is when banks and other institutions are forced to sell assets in order to shore up their balance sheet. So if you have a lot of banks and financial institutions with exposure to what's going on in Europe, either Greece or Italy or uh, Spain, then if something happens and they have a bunch of securities, bonds, for example, that start to default or go bad, they have to raise liquidity and raise cash levels. So what they'll do is they'll go and sell stocks because they're the easiest thing to sell, and that's what they'll do. And that is another form of forced selling. Forced selling just re re refers to the whole concept of when institutions are put in the position of having to sell, either as uh, investors themselves who have to cut back on their stock market holdings in order to shore up liquidity because they have holdings in other areas like European bonds that are getting shellacked or uh, becoming more and more worthless. That's one form of forced selling. And then the other one is when people want their money back. they got to bail out and give it back to them. So you know, I wouldn't worry too much about the mechanics of all that. Uh, just know that uh, it's not good for uh, the market, but it is good if you're short. Uh, Google, is Google looking like a late stage failure? It is actually. It started to break down. It started to look that way and it broke the 200 day first because the 50 day is now below the 200 day and you have a black cross down here. So, uh, you know, they're buying Motorola Mobile, which I guess is what Motorola became. Uh, stock breaking down below the 50-day moving average. Shortable, 
perhaps using the high of yesterday as a stop. I guess you could do that. Um, people asking about LinkedIn. You know, we've talked about LinkedIn. LinkedIn is not happening, so we wouldn't even bother with it. You know, you get blown out of it on a stop here, um, and it's never really come back. It almost looks like a short here, like a late stage or a first stage failed base. That's what it looks like. Oh, we got a new short selling pattern with this one. Big ugly cup and handle. It is kind of ugly when you think about it. No real tight areas in the handle, and it breaks down. You know, we were hoping it would tighten up. It looked like it was going to break out here. Uh, didn't happen, and uh, now it's starting to fail. And now you've broken the 50 day. So maybe it's a short, and maybe it's headed back to the 60 uh, price level. So, but that thing looks like a dog. What is your sell signal on the TZA, Dr. K? What is your target price target based on uh, the day's sell signal? Uh, well, I don't have price targets. I, I mean, I'm, I'm going no. always by the NASDAQ composite. Um, as my primary uh, index. So when I see, um, in other words, the model is looking for leading stock action and major indices action. But within major indices, the NASDAQ composite is the leading one. So when it senses enough selling pressure or buying pressure, it switches signals. Um, the model's on a sell right now. So if it senses enough buying pressure uh, coming into the market, then that that will push it back into either a neutral or even a buy a buy uh, signal. But uh, as far as that, you know, when that's going to happen, who knows? Uh, I never have price targets because it's impossible. I found it's quite impossible to predict the length um, and extent of a trend in either direction. Right, and but you know, you could kind of logically let's say the sell signal uh, does not get negated. Okay, in other words. You're not stopped out by the NASDAQ going through uh, the, the high of yesterday, which would correspond. Let's just look at this real quick. Well, actually, let me give you one scenario. Let's say we repeat. You know, I'm looking. I'm looking for the market to be very sloppy in here. Um, although I think the sloppiness is going to occur on the downside. Um, so let's say we repeat what we saw in May of 2010, where we undercut the low that we set a few days ago on the NASDAQ. Um, if we undercut that low and I'm starting to see either selling exhaustion or um, some support coming into leading stocks, I'm going to sense, you know, that, that, is, that could be grounds for the model switching back into neutral and taking the profit because that's a pretty sharp drop from where the market's at now to undercutting the lows set a few days ago. So, in other words, on a risk-reward basis, you've got a lot of reward on your side now. And that that in itself can push the model back into a neutral, which allows us to capture our gains. So if we broke this low, we might end up having a, what a short-term bottom. So wouldn't you say then that the TZA corresponding to that low would be this high? So you might you know you might get up to 68 from here. That might be a potential. You very well. Are you certainly? Uh, I would expect you to actually get above 68 if we undercut the lows. Um, but keep in mind that these leveraged ETFs, if, you, if we go straight down from here and undercut the lows of the NASDAQ, that's very favorable for three times ETF. Three times will actually give you more than three times what the one times do, simply because of, of the, uh, we, we talk about it in the FAQs, about the way the mechanics behind the three times ETFs. But on the other hand, if the, if the market uh, gets, undercuts its low over, the, say, the next few weeks in a sloppy manner that's almost sideways and finally breaks down, finally breaks down, um, then the three times ETFs tend to underperform their one times counterparts. So in other words, they, then in that case, the TZA would probably not, not even make it up to 68. We talk okay, about so like the, yeah, the mechanics of this um, in the FAQs if you type in uh, leveraged ETFs and you can read all about it uh, in terms of the, the mathematics behind why um, why trending markets are very favorable for three times ETFs and non-trending markets, sloppy ones, are not favorable. Um, I, I kind of like this. Case. Somebody asked, do we have a favorite index to go short on? Well, you know, NASDAQ or the Russell 2000. So the SQQQ or the TZA generally are the two higher octane ETFs to play uh, since the NASDAQ and the Russell 2000 will tend to break down faster than the S&P and the Dow. Uh, but I got to tell you, Dr. K, I'm just looking at this. If you take the signal today, 
So you're looking at downside on the TZA at 44.47 uh, if you were stopped out and you close here at uh, 47.09. So if you're able to take a position right in here on the TZA with your downside at 44.47, I think that's a pretty favorable risk reward right there, don't you? Yeah, we're, we're, it's fantastic because uh, I, I was very happy actually. It's funny because you were reading reading my mind when you said you asked me is the model is the model switching to sell is it getting close earlier today right <laughs> yeah and um, actually I was surveying um, the action of the broad based market and the leading stocks and I was I don't know if the word happy is the right word but I was actually pleased to see that the leading stocks were were not being constructive whatsoever and and the more evidence I saw the more evidence there was for the model to switch out of its neutral signal and back into a sell um, and also the, the fact of the matter that the risk in, in, in taking in the model switching to a sell signal is so small at this level. I mean, we're talking one and at one point three percent where the model did switch its signal. So uh, absolutely, on a risk reward basis, this is a, potentially a tremendous trade if if we uh, if we go lower from here and retest. Yeah, and I notice after hours it's trading uh, offered at forty six seventy one after a forty seven oh nine close. So you know that's like a five percent stop on this from here. I don't know. That looks like a good trade. I think I'll finish off with that, you guys. It is uh, two sixteen, so we've gone over. Uh, we'll see what happens over the next couple of days with the sell signal. You know where your stop is, and uh, you've seen some of the stocks that have had floater rallies recently that are coming into shortable uh, positions. But remember that a lot of times the short side is much harder. Well. I'm going to say in general, it, it is always harder than the long side because you have to be a lot more persistent and things will not, uh, oftentimes will take a little more time or not really pull up to where you think they're going to on a rally. They'll go a little bit higher, um, you know, as you saw with something like so. But if you stay on them, eventually they do uh, break down. And what you're looking for ultimately when you play one of these on a weekly chart is you're looking say, so on Sohu. And we see this setting up. You're looking for a break, you know, where it really comes down, and you've got a good uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 percent or more on the downside, and you can clean up. So, uh, you know, I'll never forget the guy who emailed me uh, back when I was in uh, New York in July of 2008, and pointing out how I thought uh, First Solar was a late stage pod, and that you should uh, short the stock in here once it breaks the 50 day. So some guy uh, emails me that somewhere in here he had bought uh, the 200 puts, and when the stock got down to 100, he emails me that $44,000 worth in puts, uh, worth of puts that he had bought, were worth 1.4 million. He wanted to know what to do, and so uh, you, you can make a lot of money on the short side. And yes, you can use options. This guy did, and I just thought it was funny that he turns 44 grand into 1.4 million, and his problem is paying the taxes. So. I would say be a patriot if you make that kind of money and pay your taxes. So on that note, everybody, thanks for listening today. We'll see where this goes, and stay tuned if we get any crazy action or wildness. Uh, we may have to have another impromptu live webinar sometime later this week. All right, everybody, take care, and we'll catch you next time. So long, everybody.